be in prayer for, of course, for all of our Easter uh, worship times, or we'll have a Monday, Thursday service as well. Uh, so, I want to encourage you to pass the word about that, and uh, just be a wonderful time of celebration uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ in this really special time. We'll also have a resurrection celebration for the children, uh, so just stay tuned for in your bulletin or in your newsletter for some of those dates and times for things coming up, so you can... Uh, you can pass the word or, or have your children or grandchildren involved in those things as well. All right. Colossians chapter 2. I want to speak to you this morning on avoiding the arrows of Satan. Avoiding the arrows of Satan. Colossians chapter 2 verses, will begin in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the, uh, the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses by, by canceling the, re the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to his cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that today as we uh, look into this passage, uh, you might give us grace and strength for the battle, that we would understand that uh, this world that in which we live is, and move as believers is uh, at its essence at enmity with our God and our Christ. And therefore, if we live for you, we will sometimes be the object of false teaching, of Satan, of the evil one. Help us, Lord, to know how to combat that, to do spiritual warfare, how to be fruitful and thankful and powerful in Christ in spite of these things. Lord, these have not taken you by surprise. We pray that they would not take us by surprise. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that evil is real? Is there a such a person as Satan? Paul warns the Colossians about a spiritual war that is raging for their souls. He does not tell them that to, this to scare them, but to instruct them. How can Christians safely navigate a hostile world system and a powerful evil army as they seek to live for God's glory? We've been saying all along that Paul is preparing to deal with the false teaching that is making inroads into the Colossian church. We said before that the, the strategy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the Apostle Paul is to elevate Christ so that the Colossians realize what the, is the gospel and that they are complete in Christ so that the false teaching becomes plain and obvious. And with, we said that 
that he makes more of living for Christ, he makes more of the doctrines of Christ and the person of Christ than he does of the false teaching. There are other passages in the, in the New Testament where, where Paul exposes outright the false teaching. He attacks it. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, the book of Galatians. He comes out of the gate dealing with the false teaching of Galatianism. But Colossians is different. The Colossian believers had not completely given way to the false teaching that was making inroads. The Colossians were still firmly in Christ. It's just that this false teaching was being pushed into the, into the congregation. And so Paul is, ta- is made aware of this by Epaphras. Uh, and so Paul addresses it. Having said that, though, we need to understand that he does, he does expose some of the false teaching, and, and, uh, but just not on the same level. And today we are moving into that section where he begins his, his attack, if you will, of some of the false ideas that the Colossian church is dealing with. And so we're going to see that this morning. And we see this, uh, this spiritual battle that believers find themselves in. And I think this is something that we need to, to embrace, we need to understand. The epistles of the Bible and the New Testament teach clearly that we Christians are on enemy territory. Peter says, Our enemy, Satan, as a roaring lion, roams about, seeking whom he may devour. Paul tells Timothy to prepare for hardship and endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul tells Timothy, That in the last days, there will be some who will not tolerate, will not endure biblical or sound or healthy teaching. So over and over, we are told to be prepared. Jude says, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation that we have. In other words, Jude wanted to take sort of Paul's attitude in the book of Colossians. But then Jude backs up and says, But it was needful for me to earnest to encourage you to earnestly contend for the faith. In other words, to be willing and able and prepared to, to defend the faith of Christ, to be ready to understand that the faith is under attack. And if you believe it, so are you. Now, this is not a message on Satan, but I'll answer my question coming out the door. (laughs) Evil is real, and Satan is real. The Bible presents Satan as an individual, as a real individual. Yes, he is a spiritual being, but he is real. Evil is real. Evil is not just a mindset. Evil is not the need of the masses. Or any such philosophical nonsense is that. Evil is that principle that is against God and His law. Evil, we might say, is sin. And sin is the transgression of God's law, the Bible says. So the Apostle Paul is reminding the Colossians of what it means to be a Christian. Since since from the beginning the Colossian church had done well, but at the same time of the writing of this epistle, they had, become, uh, had begun to experience the entrance of false teaching. And I contend to you that that will happen to every gospel church that ever exists. Okay? Because we have an enemy. Christ has an enemy. And so this is why Peter tells us to, be, to give all diligence, to be Awake, aware, to be ready, he says. There are three things that the apostle tells them that they should be pursuing in their lives that will bring about spiritual maturity. How do we combat this? And now, there are several approaches. You know, some people make this their whole Christian life. 
They're looking, as it were, for the boogeyman around every corner and every bush. But that's not what Paul does here. Paul urges the Christians to maturity. How do we fight Satan? How do we resist evil? The truth is, and be fruitful, and be godly, and to be filled with love for our fellow believers and for God, those are not two different tasks. They are one and the same. To resist Satan, as James says, is also to embrace Christ and to live for Him. There is not two different things. You know, we're going to do war with, with Satan and evil, and at the same time we need to love Jesus and worship Him and be fruitful in, in His ministry and gospel. There's not two of those. They are one and the same. As we, we will see that as we pursue Christ... We are doing battle with Satan. So I think this is, once again, a tactic of Satan to sidetrack us. He would love us to spend our time chasing him. Now he's the center of attention. What he doesn't want is for us to give our time, our love, our passion, our faith, our energy, our strength, our vitality to Christ and his word and his gospel. That's what he doesn't want. And so he's all about getting us sidetracked, all about diverting our attention from, to, to, to anything. It can be a, a good thing as opposed to an excellent thing, which is Jesus. Or it could be full-on evil. It doesn't matter to him. And so our goal really needs to be exactly what Paul says here. We need to learn from what he says to the Colossians to be pursuing maturity in Christ, to be pursuing Him. So he says three things here that, uh, that helps us. You know, I was thinking yesterday, it's funny how we always say there's three things, you know. But, but then I thought, well, why is there always three things? I mean, I do have sermons that have more than, one, you know, more than three points, but, but, uh, but most of the time it seems like it's three. And I, and I began to think about that, and I thought, well... Isn't that in, in consistent with our faith? It's a Trinitarian faith. Nobody said, I mean, when sermons started, began to take form what we're used to now, nobody said, all right, so we need to think of, we need to have three points. You know, it was more or less three is what it seemed to be. And I think, well, that's because... The Bible is written in a Trinitarian way, in my opinion. You know, God has, he puts things in three ways. Why? Because he is one God in three persons. I don't know. That just seems to make sense to me. Anyway, that's a footnote. But if you're like me, you've probably thought of that. You know, why has every sermon got three points? I don't know. I'm a preacher and I'll still do it. So it seems to fit. All right, so three things. Three things, but number one, in verses 6 and 7, Paul tells them, therefore, and on what we've been talking about, he's now going to apply it. Remember we said we're in this, this thankful, prayerful part, and then a solid, very deep, profound doctrinal section about the person and work of Jesus. And then I said then the next thing he's going to do is apply that. Here we are. Therefore. So since these things are true, now, how does this doctrine, this truth about Jesus Christ and who He is affect our belief system and our lives and how we live them? That's the whole idea. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, there it is, so walk in Him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving so we see in verse six and seven he says be walking be walking now what does be walking mean well of course in the bible the word the idea of walking is a metaphor oftentimes 
unless it's telling a narrative, you know, so-and-so walked over to, you know, this kind of thing. But when it, in this kind of context, when it says be walking, it, in other words, it means as you walk through your daily life, as you live your life, it sees life as a journey. And, and this journey, we're walking through life. And so he says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Be walking. Yes, our faith has content. It has doctrinal, theological truth rooted in historical accuracy it has content but it's not just a doctrinal statement it is a doctrinal belief system that produces a changed life why because it's rooted in the person of jesus christ himself and his work and so he says as you have received christ so there shouldn't be this disconnect that we, we receive Jesus and then live like the world, as we oftentimes see, there is a profound transformation, haven't we? We saw, we saw that last week. We talked about that, how he, he translated us or he transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his beloved Son. So there's been a transformation Okay, that's all been spiritual. That's all been invisible. What is not invisible is this part. As all of that has happened, so live and walk in a way that corresponds to what's happened to you spiritually. Be walking. The faith of Jesus Christ is all-encompassing. Paul tells them that just as they have received Christ Jesus as Lord, they must follow through, purging their lives of all that is contrary to the gospel of Christ. How is this done? It is done by the believer, continuing on to maturity through becoming rooted in the teachings of Christ, which builds up their faith in Him, causing them to become established in Him. The end result is a deep and a profound thankfulness springing from a more complete understanding and experience of Christ himself. That is what Paul is saying here. He is saying that we live our life rooted and built up and abounding in thanksgiving. Now let's break some of that down, figure out what that's talking about. 1 John, we can see the same kind of concept, 1 John 1, 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light, there's that walking again. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Or we might say, we call him a liar. And his word is not in us. Okay? And what does that mean? His truth is not in us. His word is not in us. What does that mean? It means we're not really Christians. It means we're not really saved. That's what that means. To have the truth in you, or the word in you, means to be saved. That's what he's talking about. If we, if we deny these truths, what truths? That we're sinners and that Christ is a substitution, substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Then he says, there's no, no, no forgiveness for you. The truth is not in you. You're not. The word is not in you. 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides or dwells or sets up camp, you might say, in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. So if you say that you have pitched your tent in Christ, then you ought to walk or live your life as Christ walked and lived his life. You see the connect? There is always that connect. There is, James said it another way, faith without works 
is dead. That's right. See, some people say, well, see, Paul and James disagree with each other. No, <laughs> not in any way, shape, or form. Paul is clearly teaching the same thing that Peter taught and James taught. There's a complete unity here in what's going on. So what does it mean to be walking, to live our life in this way that, that has this motion, this movement towards spiritual maturity? Well, the first thing he says is to be rooted. He uses sort of this tree image in, in some ways, a plant image. of, And that's why, you know, and you think, okay, well, that's sort of a mixture. You know, we're walking, but now we're talking about trees and plants. I don't know. That's, that's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's not mine. <laughs> but, but, but what Paul is saying is we want to live our life for Christ. We want to live in this way of maturity that moves us toward maturity. Maturity is always a journey. It always has this direction, and the direction is always toward Christ. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we've got that concept, but now he switches the imagery and goes to the idea of a tree or a plant that is a beautiful, flourishing, stable, strong plant that's producing fruit and that's, that's, that's mature enough to produce fruit. That's what he's... That's, That's the transition that he goes to, which starts with a strong root system. So as a tree receives nourishment from the root, believers receive grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He he wants us to understand that the spiritual vitality, the spiritual life, the spiritual grace that it takes for you and me to be saved, that it takes for you you and me to grow for you and me to be fruitful, comes from Christ himself. Remember, before he used the body language. He says, Christ is the head, we are the body, and the whole body with joints and marrow fit together, all receiving the nourishment from the head, which is Christ. Okay. Now he switches the imagery, because these are spiritual truths, not literal. Now he switches the imagery and goes from the body, head, scenario to the a tree or a plant that is healthy and mature that's stable and strong ready to produce fruit that resists the weather resists the heat resists the drought resists the storm and nonetheless still puts out fruit still provides shade still is strong and growing that's what he's talking about that's the concept that he's shooting for and rooted and built up, rooted and built up and established. You see that idea of a strong, maybe like a fruit tree? You know, you plant one, you nurture it, it's feeble, you put a little thing around it, you you know, all this kind of stuff, you protect it, you're scared to death, the bugs are going to kill it, or the weather's going to get it, or an animal's going to eat it, you know, all this kind of stuff. The ants or the bugs are going to get in it. You know, and you just nurture and baby and take care of it because it's so fragile. But eventually, that plant gets strong. Its root systems go deep. It begins to be stable. Now it puts out the leaf system. It can weather the storm. Its immune system can put off, can fight off disease or, or bugs and so forth. And now we have a tree that can produce fruit. So that we've got that's that whole idea, rooted and established and built up. That's the whole idea. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse eleven through thirteen. Now may our God and Father Himself uh, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love one for another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You see, it's not only in our day that people come and make professions of faith and then attend for a while and disappear. It happened in the early church too. It happened in the Old Testament too. 
And so Paul is saying, be rooted, be established. This is one of the problems sometimes with what we call decisionalism, where a preacher preaches and and everything he does is to push people to make a decision for Jesus. And so it's very emotional, it's very, you know, pressure-oriented, and oftentimes people will give way to that. Sometimes people really genuinely are saved. I'm not denying that. But a lot of times it, it, it creates this environment where people buckle under the pressure and they will come and make pro- professions of faith, they will join the church, they will do all kinds of things like that, and then when the storm hits, when the rain comes, when the persecution rises, when the difficulty of living for Christ, when Satan turns up the heat and, and on the onslaught, they suddenly burn out and disappear. This is the whole, the whole idea of Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed and the soils. Because there are those who spring up quickly. They, they you know, seem to show that there's something there, but then they burn out. The weeds choke them out. The, the heat, the sun, the, the birds steal the seed away, and on and on. And remember, by the way, the, what was the bird stealing the, heat away, the, the seed away? That was Satan, wasn't it? Satan stealing the seed. Okay, we're back to that, aren't we? Avoiding the arrows of Satan. Avoiding, there is this spiritual warfare. And this uh, is something we've got to understand. Hebrews 13, 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Not by food, which have not benefit do not benefit those to, that are devoted to it. In other words, he says, listen, we're talking about the spiritual life. Food has nothing to do with this. You need the grace of Christ. You need to be strengthened spiritually through Christ. 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11. And after you have suffered a little while, The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ with himself restore, comfort, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice how Paul keeps praying. Notice how Peter prays. Notice how the writer of the Hebrews, they're constantly saying, we're praying for you that God would establish you that God would drive your roots deep, that God would make you uh, firm and rooted and so forth. Why? Because this is the work of Christ. This is what every believer needs. Yes, we should believe the gospel. Absolutely. We should repent of our sins and believe in Jesus. And if you came to an altar call or a revival service or, and, and did that, that's fine. But understand that just checking a box, yes, or responding to an altar call, the deal is not done. (laughs) When we profess Christ, when we confess Christ, we are saying, He is Lord. He is my God, my Master. There's not this, I checked the box and I'm okay and now I'm gone. I've got my fire insurance. There is no fire insurance. That doesn't exist. There is a Lord, a Savior, a Master. And we that believe in Him, joyfully, gladly, we're like Mary. We drop at His feet. We wipe His feet with our tears. We love Him. Those that do not will someday be forced to bow every tongue and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, that's the issue. That's the point. That's the whole point of Christianity. And we need to understand that everything is rooted in Christ. Everything we follow for Him. Everything we get from Him. 1 Thessalonians, and then that results as we root and we grow, we become established, then that results in thanksgiving, praying without ceasing, and giving thanks for all things, 1 Thessalonians, abounding in thanksgiving. So let me say this again. Be, the faith of Jesus Christ is all-encompassing. Paul tells us that just as they received Christ Jesus as Lord, they must 
follow through, purging their lives of all that is contrary to the gospel. How is this done? It's done by the believer continuing on to maturity through the becoming rooted in the teaching of Christ, which builds up their faith in him, causing them to become established in him. And the end result is a deep and a profound thankfulness springing forth from a complete understanding and experience of Christ himself. That's what Paul, you say, well, Scott, that's pretty deep. That's right, it is. I didn't make that up. Paul did through the Holy Spirit, okay? But that is it. And that's why our faith is so profound. So that's walking. That's your daily life. That's living for Jesus. Rooted, established, and giving thanks. Rooted. That's living for Jesus. That's your life. And that's your first uh, defense, if you will, against Satan and evil. is to be in Christ, following in Him. The second thing he he says here is, we said be walking. The second one is be aware. Or we might even say beware. (laughs) Verse 8, look at that. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He says, beware. Do not allow yourselves to be taken captive, to be kidnapped, if you will, to be deceived, to be seized, almost against your will, into false teaching and false ideologies, concepts and philosophies, and traditions that are opposed to Christ. Beloved, we have a mandate to not only resist false teachings and ideologies that are contrary to Christ, but also, Jude, to wage war on them, to earnestly contend for the faith. We're not only to just sit by and say, that's a false teaching, and then take a nap. But we're to say that's false teaching and then begin to go after it. It's a cancer. It's deadness in the body. It's Satan's arrows. It is Satan moving into the Christ's body, bringing forth death. He says, do not allow yourselves to be brought captive, to be enslaved, to be kidnapped, to be deceived. By philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, and elemental spirits. The first thing he says is philosophy and vain deceit. Those go together. Okay? Philosophy and vain deceit. Those are, those are together. Just think of the word and as a link in, in a chain. And it's holding those two concepts together. So what Paul is saying is the philosophy is vain deceit. Okay? That's the way we need to understand this philosophy. Is there legitimate philosophy? Yeah, there's legitimate philosophy out there. But there is a lot that is vain or empty, empty deceit. Okay? This refers to ideologies and philosophical systems constructed by men and women for their own vain deceit, their own deceitful purposes. Such ideologies that are contrary to Christ and His Word are to be noted and avoided as opposing Christ and useless to the salvation of souls. Let me say that again. This refers to ideologies and philosophical systems constructed by men and women for their own vain deceit, their own selfish motives. Such ideologies that are contrary to Christ and of His Word are to be noted and avoided as opposing Christ and useless in the salvation of souls, and useless in the salvation of souls, and useless in the salvation of souls. It is an enemy of our faith. It is an enemy of Christ. John Owen says the great secret purpose of sinful man is to be going on is to go on living his sinful life with as little trouble as possible in the present life, and with every hope of avoiding future punishment in the next. Let me read that again. John Owen. 
The great secret purpose of sinful man is to go on living his sinful life with as little trouble as possible in this present life and, the, and, the, and with every hope of avoiding future punishments in the next. That's the secret purpose of every, quite honestly, every one of us as sinners. Except for when we've been redeemed by Christ and now we begin to wage war against that sinful nature in us that is waging war against our Master and our Lord. Okay? We now, as believers, we recognize there is within us no good thing. There is within us this sinful principle that's at war with God. And so with the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter 5 and 6, we wage war against our own sinful natures. But the rest of the world is opposed to Christ. That's John Owen, Apostasy from the Gospel, page 61. Philosophy and vain deceit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, For we did, did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter says, We did not give our lives to myths. We did not follow things made up by people. We followed the revelation of God through Jesus Christ and the Word of God. If this book is not dependable, then I'll tell you, you, you know what? Close it and go home. Go to the lake. Go have a party. Go do something or go find a religion that is true. But this is it right here. Don't follow Jesus Christ just because somebody told you to. Follow it because this book tells is the truth, and it tells the truth. We have nothing else to rest on. Nothing. You take this book out. We have nothing. And if you start going through this book and saying, you can trust this part, but you can't trust that part, you know, you know what? Then how do we know that the part you say we can trust, we can really trust? Maybe, maybe you got it backwards. The, part we, the other part we can trust and what you think we can trust. Who's to say? You see, that's what Paul said to the Thessalonians. He said, you received the gospel as it is indeed, the word of God. You see, that's what's important. My words don't carry salvation. These words carry salvation. That's what Paul told Timothy. He said, preach the word. Because Peter, uh, Timothy, this is what you were taught by your grandmother and your mother. And they're able to make you wise unto salvation. Boom. There it is. The Word of God. And I say that because our whole culture today is designed to wage war on your faith. If you do not understand that, you're going to be taken captive. Our whole society is designed to steal your children from you. Do you understand that? It is designed to take your children's minds and hearts and souls away from you and away from Jesus Christ. You'll love them and care for them and take them to Sunday school and teach them the Word and have family devotions and tell them I love this book and to love God and then pay thousands of dollars to send them to a university where some lying, cheating, backstabbing, so-called professor stands up and undermines everything that you've done as a parent. I can't tell you how deceitful and ungodly that is. To take your money as a parent then destroy your children. What a coward, male or female. What a coward. Stand at the front door of the university and tell those parents, I will teach your children to hate the Bible and hate Jesus Christ. I will teach them to deny you and hate you as parents and everything that you stand for and see if they sign up their children. No, they won't. They'll stand there th in their classrooms and they'll smile at you and talk about what a wonderful education they have and how great it is while, while you pay the bill and leave 
And now they turn it into a party atmosphere and turn their child, your children against everything that you believe in. When are American people, when are Christians going to stop this? When are we going to stop giving God's money and our money to organizations that are meant to send our children to hell and turn them against us and our God? Stop it. The moment that university or that college turns on God, you pull your kids out of there. And if your kids say, I love it, I want to go there. You know what? Well, then pay your own way. But I won't pay for you to be taught to hate me, to hate my church, to hate my God, and to hate my truth. I've got no respect for any professor who hides behind his degrees and his institution while he rips the faith and value system of a, of a child away from their parents and away from their faith. Every professor out there, I know, I've taught in, in college, I know, every professor out there stands at the front of that classroom and he, is, he and she is intimidating to those children. There were times in my early education where that doctor so-and-so, it didn't matter what he said, it had to be right. That man knew more than I ever thought could, would be possibly known. And it's wrong to use that influence in the hearts and minds of children and young adults like that. That's wrong. It is a sacred trust that should be regarded with respect. And that's just our institutions, but it's going on in, in our churches too. Beloved, we are in a war, and we need to understand, we need to be aware. Philosophy and vain deceit. Nietzsche says, God is dead. God's not in vogue anymore. Do you know anything about Nietzsche? You might want to study his life. You might find out that he didn't have it right. The man was a disaster. Was he brilliant? Oh, yeah. He was, a, he was smart. But anybody that, that is clear about these things can read his philosophy and know it is empty deceit. The whole purpose was to destroy Western civilization. Not just uh, He had a special hatred for Christianity. <laughs> but he hated all of Western civilization. And quite honestly, he was smarter than 98% of us. And I'll throw myself in on that. So he was able to formulate empty deceit into philosophy. And we're all wowed by it. Nietzsche, Kant, all the while, while they destroy everything that's sacred. Tradition of men and elemental spirits of the world. This makes reference to the Jewish legalism. That's what this is referring to. Just as the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, "Why do you?" They said, "Why?" The Pharisees said, "Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat." He answered them, "And why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother will surely die." But you say, if anyone tells his father and his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the, the word of God. All right, so here's what's happening. The word of God said, honor your father and your mother. The Pharisees came along and they took made into a tradition the, the general idea, this sort of, massaged that idea into, well, you don't have to honor your father and your mother if you say the honor and respect in, that I gave you, I'm going to give to God. And therefore, 
that gets you out of having to honor your father and your mother. Okay? Sounds nice, doesn't it? I'm going to honor God, not my father and my mother. And so that, that, avoids, that voids my, my responsibility to my mom and dad. Sound good? Yes, did to everybody else too. That's what became Judaism. And so they came to Jesus and said this, why do, your, why do your disciples break our tradition and not wash like they should? And Jesus said, why do you break God's word with your tradition? Which is more important? Tradition or the word of God? Did God say, as long as you give the honor to me, you don't have to honor your father and mother? Is that what God said? See, this is the same thing Satan did to Eve, isn't it? Surely God knows. It's a, it's a twist, isn't it? It's a very fine twist. Now, here's what God said. You want to honor me? Honor your father and mother. It's a drastic difference, isn't it? Drastic difference. But when it's said the way the Pharisees said it, it sounds right, doesn't it? Sounds right. Jesus confronted them head on and said, Why does your tradition break the commandment of God? Honor your father and your mother. I use that as an example. Be aware. Be aware. You say, Well, Scott, how do I know? I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know how to distinguish all that. I don't, I've never read Nietzsche. I've never read, read, read Kant or, or, you know, I don't know what to do with these. How do I know if it's wrong or if it's right? Remember what we said? How do you do this? Pursue Christ. Pursue Christ. Being rooted and established and abounding in thanksgiving. You don't have to read Kant. You don't have to read Nietzsche or any of those things. Because why? Because the last thing... Be full, be full. Look in verses 9 through 10. This is exactly what Paul says. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all the rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses by canceling out the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This, this he set aside, nailing it to his cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in in. Him. Notice that? In Him. In Him. In Him. In Him. All you need is Christ. That's what Paul is saying. You have everything you need. Pursue Christ. Don't pursue empty legalism. Don't pursue Gnosticism. Don't pursue empty philosophies that are designed by people who are filled with themselves. Don't pursue empty tradition. Pursue Christ and His Word. In Him is the fullness of deity. You want to know God? The fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ bodily. You say, why does He throw the word bodily in there? He's fighting that Gnosticism. He's fighting that Greek mythology, Greek philosophy. In Him is the fullness of God. You want to know God? Know Christ. In Him is the highest authority. You want to respect the highest authority? It's in Jesus. In Him is the spiritual purity and regeneration. You don't need the circumcision of, the, of Jewish legalism or any of those things to be pure or to have regeneration. You have it in Christ. In Christ is the regeneration. In Christ is circumcision. In Him is the full, full forgiveness, he says. In Him is victory over Satan and evil. Look in that verse that last verse, he says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. 
Christ is over the spiritual authorities. There is no need to pray to angels. There is no need to do the, any of this other spiritual stuff to know God and to get right with God. All of that is to be found in Jesus Christ alone. That's what Paul is saying. So how do we avoid the darts of the, uh, and the, the arrows of the enemy? Pursue Christ. Rooted in His Word, being established in His faith and in His person, abounding in thanksgiving. And then that is safety and security established by God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. Thank you that these are things we would never think of, never dream of, but Lord, you have given them to us through the Apostle Paul as we live in a hostile culture toward our faith. We pray, dear God, that you would give us courage and strength, Lord, to resist uh, this progressive movement against you and against your word, Lord, to bend it, twist it, change it, Make it in the image of the world. Help us, Father, to have the faith and the strength to be rooted in Christ, to be established and confident in Him, to be a thankful people, abounding in thanksgiving, because we know that everything we need is in Jesus, is in Christ alone. In Him we know You, in Him we have forgiveness. In him, in him we have purity and regeneration and new life. In Him we have authority. And in Him we have victory over Satan and evil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will take your hymnal. We'll stand together. We'll sing.